So there's a time for everything in the markets. And sometimes it's, you know, the good idea is to do nothing, you know, just to, to have cash and sit there and wait. And, uh, you know, I think that's sort of where we are now. But I also think that'll change in, you know, the fall. All right, everybody, welcome to the Angel Research Podcast. I am your host, Jason Stutman. And as usual, we are here today to discuss the market's hottest investment opportunities and stock stories. And to help us uh, do that today, we have Christian DeHamer on the show, uh, a.k.a. The Hammer. <laughs> Uh, Chris is a uh, absolute veteran in the newsletter industry. He's been doing this for decades. Uh, really smart guy that you know. I think we're going to kind of hear a, a lot of his knowledge today. Um, I would say that I would probably categorize uh, Chris as an expert in technical trading and then uh, macroeconomics and geopolitics. Um, Chris has a really good handle of uh, all the stuff that's going on in the world, and uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about the macro situation and a uh, specific uh, geopolitical situation as well. Um, quick disclaimer, nothing that we say here is financial advice. Uh, we can give you the ideas and the insights that you need to make great financial decisions, but we cannot make those decisions for you. Um, Chris, we usually kind of start this out with a little bit of background. Maybe you could tell the, uh, the audience like a little bit about yourself, how you got into the investing space, how you got into newsletters, and we'll go from there. Well, I've been in, uh, I started in 1995 um, writing about the markets and uh, working for a major news, newsletter company. Um, and I've, uh, I started out writing about international markets, um, uh, emerging markets, Thailand, uh, when China was coming up, things of that nature, a lot of oil and gas. Um, and then, uh, you know, we had the dot com era and bust, and then, you know, the housing era and bust and so like uh i've been moving you know i'll uh, i believe in the secular bull markets and so like uh I'll, you know and you always have to new learn new ticker symbols new companies and always be out there and, and uh you know finding out what the next uh the next really the next secular bull market is because and by secular i mean like generational like once like Bull markets tend to last about 16 years, and so you'll have, you know, the Nasdaq boom of the late 1990s, and then they died, and it didn't uh, hit a new high until I think 2013 or something. And then you had just we just survived another, you know, big Nasdaq tech boom, and uh, so now the question is, uh, where are we gonna, where are we gonna head from here? It seems to me like there is. Uh no bull market going on right now. It's like uh, I've been talking about this with a lot of different, uh, you know, investors and people mm -hmm. that are, you know, really involved in this space. And people seem to like, you know, it used to be gold. And we were kind of talking about this yeah. the other day, too. That, but it seems like everything is just moving in lockstep at this very moment. And everything's just going down uh, together. So uh, where where is the next bull market? Wow. The great irony is that the uh, hedge against inflation is cash, you know, whereas the only the only thing going up now is the dollar, um, or at least the last month or so. But uh, what you have is you know this pullback in liquidity, and you have people selling everything across the board. This happens at the end of uh, bull markets or the beginning of a bear market. Um, you, we saw it in two thousand and nine. They sold gold and gold miners all the way down because you know you start getting hit with margin calls. You start wanting to just raise cash, and you'll sell everything with. It doesn't matter what it is. Sure. You just want to raise cash. And then at the bottom, you know, in 2009, you could have bought these gold stocks. And they went up, you know, 3,000, 5,000 percent, these junior miners, because gold went from, you know, 1,100 to 1,700 or whatever. And, uh, and junior miners are leveraged. And so, so there's a time for everything in the markets. And sometimes it's, you know, the good idea is to do nothing, you know, just to, to have cash and sit there and wait. And, uh, you know, I think that's sort of where we are now. But I also think that'll change in, you know, the fall here in the third quarter. I think that'll change. What do you think is going to trigger that change? Well, I think uh, there's going to be a – well, I think oil and energy, the physical oil and energy are in high demand. Meanwhile, um, you know, the paper oil and energy is, is selling off. Because you have a number of things, you have uh, – uh, Joe Biden selling our strategic petroleum reserves, which he sold 27 million barrels last month, 
Um, but he can only do that for so long. That'll be empty in 18 months if he continues on okay. that pace. Okay, so what percentage of it have we already sold off, roughly? Do you know? Um, I don't know, 10. I have okay, it okay, sure. Yeah. Basis. But I just know you can't do it. At some point, you have to say, well, we need it for a real emergency. Sure. Right? And then at what point is that? And, you know. What's going on with shale right now? Is, is anyone like, Shale oil? Yeah. Shale oil is picking back up, um, incrementally producing more. Um so it's it's easing the 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 cost of uh you know our oil on the global scale but uh one thing is like uh europe wants natural gas to heat their houses they got 80 percent of their natural gas from russia and they're not getting that anymore sure and uh but the u.s the u.s last month had more sold more europe bought more natural gas from the u.s than russia last month for the first time ever but the U.S. had a big fire on one of its export terminals, which is uh, in repair until November. Hmm. And so natural gas in the U.S. fell from like $9 to $6.20, while in Europe it did the other thing, and it went from you know $25 to $35 or something. Okay. Uh, what about the CPI readout that we got yesterday? Um, well, It's a little bit higher than expected. Yeah. Should, is this something we should be concerned about? Do we think that maybe – I was surprised to see that the market didn't actually sell off too hard yesterday on that, uh, selling off a little bit more today. And like you've kind of said some things that the you know first reaction is always wrong. Uh, yeah. So uh, you know, what's your take on that on that readout? Well, I think uh, I think the inflation is going to be here for probably five years. I think uh, we'll have that sort of inflation. It, it'll it'll fluctuate obviously, but I think what you have is a global phenomenon. Whereas in the past. Um, for the past 30 years, essentially, we've been exporting our production to low-cost centers, right, and then bringing it back. And so that's a natural deflationary sure. you know, situation. But now we're having to redo our supply chains. We're rebuilding stuff in the United States or rebuilding it in Mexico. And uh, so that's an inflationary uh, prospect because we have to buy more – more stuff to build more factories and you have to and it doesn't happen overnight it takes a couple of years and that, and then it'll eventually work itself out so is that kind of the theme a theme that you see kind of playing out over the next like five to ten years is this deglobalization or is like part of me thinks that this is all kind of just temporary and mm-hmm. if you know if the if the you know war in ukraine kind of settles down or if the you know all the kind of like aftershock that we've had from covid passes and we're going to start to you know, reach a period of globalization again. But another part of me says that the world is kind of realizing that we can't really rely on this, a period of just pure stability. Uh, where do you see things heading uh, on a, you know, general well, geopolitical? I think, I think, well, first of all, uh, Chairman Xi uh, uh, of China is a, is a, is a very much an a autocratic dictator who, you know, has, con- has pulled all the controls to himself and so th- th- there's a lot of talk that uh, China doesn't have any flexibility to accomplish anything, you know. So, uh, so they're going to have, I mean, their vaccine doesn't work, and they're out there shutting down um, cities, and they'll open the city, and then they'll get more disease, and then they'll shut down the city. And sure. Then, but, like, the, the basic is he doesn't care. I mean, he cares about power. He doesn't care about the fallout of... You know, how it affects the economy. He doesn't care about his people. He certainly doesn't care about the stock market. I mean, he shut down like Alibaba. And he, you know, yeah. he took his greatest entrepreneurs and he like disappeared them for like six months. Yeah, where's, Jack, where's Jack Ma? Yeah, I know. And so you, ha- you have that sort of situation. And if you don't have that flexibility at a time when China has, you know, debt of 350, you know, per GDP, 350% of GDP, and then you know, you have a very serious problem. On top of that, they have a falling uh, demographics. You know, they're going to have more 60-year-olds than 20-year-olds. So would you say that China's a paper tiger? Is that your kind of stance on them? Or Well, I think China's very real and, and, and scary, and, you know, they have nuclear bombs, and Z wants to maintain control at whatever cost, and so the end game there can be, you know— Sure. All sorts of bad, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But I'm saying that as a threat for, you know, yeah, they're a paper tiger in the sense that they're road and, and belt initiative and they're, they're going to take over Africa or South America and all that sort of stuff. Or that we should be scared of them in a fundamental economic sense is, is yeah, hogwash. 
What about um? Because on let's like kind of switch topics here for a second. What about um? Magnesium is something that you've been talking about a lot lately. Yeah, well, well, magnesium is used in the high strength steel. Like, for example, I mean, not high strength steel, high strength aluminum. For example, Ford F one fifties have nine hundred pounds of high strength aluminum in their in their um, beds, right? You know, the big famous switch from steel, and uh, aluminum is used in all sorts of things, laptop covers, you know, whatever. And you need this magnesium, and uh, China makes eighty five percent of the world's magnesium. Uh, they shut down 40 of their 55 processing plants. Also, to make magnesium is very dirty traditionally, and so uh, it's a but it's a byproduct of steel, right? Is that the is that the case generally? No, I mean it's a mineral. It's mined. Okay. And then it's produced, smelted. Okay. But like uh, here, let me just just today this this came out. Um, Kaiser Aluminum Corporation announced a force majeure at one of its facilities due to a limited availability of magnesium utilized in the production of certain of its aluminum beverage and food packaging products. So the company has stopped um, producing magnesium. So you're going to have trouble, you know, your soda cans get more expensive and, and sure. all that sort of stuff. Uh, so you're, you're talking about clean versus dirty uh, magnesium. Are there any clean ways of making magnesium or... Um, there's certain, uh, yeah, it goes through a uh, sort of complicated process where it it, it uh, cleans up after itself through, uh, you know, enclosed uh, spaces. They do a carbon capture, right? Yeah, carbon capture plus other things. Okay. And uh, and they reuse the heat. So, uh, you know, so instead of, you know, making a giant mess, they, uh, they keep it cleaner. Um, it's a different process altogether than what's used in uh, – in China, which is basically just straight up heat blasting. So, are we doing that in America? Where is that? Where is that? We have one. We have one small company that has a uh, a plant that just built in Ohio that is a uh, you know um, a proof of concept plant, and this is you know a tiny penny stock, but it's the only one that's coming to America that uh, at this at this point that's going to make magnesium in America, and they they have uh, big plans to ramp up uh, considerably. Okay. Do you know how much they're making, or when they plan on bringing bringing? Well, uh, they that just plant finished. Online? They just finished the uh, the first part of it, and the next the next stage is uh, is early next year. Okay. So, you know, we're we're very early on in this process, but you gotta you gotta realize this is like a a five, ten, twenty year uh, process where industry will come back to the United States or North America more specifically, and uh, you know supply chains will shorten. You know, products will be made here. So you said that you have uh, that's that's one stock that you're eyeing right now, or yeah. one that it is publicly traded. It is publicly traded. And yes. are there uh, are there other companies in the U.S. that you're because you were talking to me about earlier about you know robotics and automation? Uh, are there yeah. any more companies that you're kind of eyeing right now that you're interested in in terms of like this this American manufacturing boom that you're predicting? Yeah, well, the, uh, an overarching theme of all this is we need more people. We need to, more people to build things. And, uh, and robotics has gotten to the point where AI and, uh, you know, your battery packs and your computer power and your actual physical robotics, you know, we've all seen those Boston Scientific dogs jumping around. All of that has come to the point where you can have a, a realistic humanoid uh, workable robot. And uh, Elon Musk is coming out with his... Uh, Do you think that's real? you think that's <laughs> part of me? I think that's bullshit kind of. But, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel like he promises so many different, uh, you know, like big. Yeah, well, you know, but he's flying to Mars. I yeah, mean, he's yeah. got these giant yeah. spaceships. I mean, he's, you know, maybe he promises ten and gives you a seven, but you know, sure. he sure he sure is doing more than everybody else is. It yeah, seems yeah. To me. <laughs> so is that is that the future we're heading towards? Is just kind of where robots are doing everything for us? Where do where do people find their? Uh, their value in a, in a society like you know that. it's kind of a it's an interesting philosophical question because you have that uh you know ai can write poetry and ai can uh they, they have that art thing now where you can type in you know whatever do you think a, ai is going to start writing stock what? newsletters and put you out of a job they are, they are writing they write yeah. just read zach's it's all written by yeah, computer. yeah. yeah. <laughs> zach's is garbage every time yeah. you see it you're like yeah it's a, you could tell that it's auto-generated right you know right but they're out there but it's getting better though yeah, no, slowly getting better. It but is. I don't. Well, but I don't know. 
what is it, sixty percent of the market's a computer anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. Eighty percent. You're talking that's... about actual trading, right? Algos, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Okay. Um, look, I think we'll uh, we'll probably just wrap it up here. Huh? Um, for the uh, magnesium stock, uh, do you have a report on that? Are you how how can people get that information? We if, have a report on that. Yes, that's in my uh, trading service. Uh, uh, Launchpad Trader. We use trading systems that uh, follow uh, trends, and so it's a great it's a great system. It gets you into the market, keeps you out of the market in bad markets. I mean, we went short today on one stock, um, and uh, the uh, the other one I have a we were talking about AI robots. Um, I have a I found a small company that uh, developed the sensors that allow a robot to know where it is in, in you know in space in the universe. Um, allow it to do what it needs to do, keep it upright, and things like that. Sure. Is that, is that the uh, FOGs or the inter- inertial measurement units? Yeah, yeah, it's it's sort of we like to I like to call it a uh, you know inner ear of a robot. Gotcha. So it keeps it balanced. It also uses GPS and spatial coordination, so it'll get you you know where the robot wants to go and do what it needs to do. Okay, cool. I'm definitely bullish on sensors. Uh, that's, yeah. that, that sounds pretty interesting. Yeah. So uh, we'll leave a couple of links in the description so that okay. people can check out these uh, these stories, the the automation story, the magnesium story. Okay. And uh, you know they could check out your newsletters and see if it would be right for them. And uh, Chris, thanks for being on the show. All right. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate it.